Hello and welcome to Your Property Empire. I'm Chris Gray. On tonight's show, what new rules for plant and equipment deductions were proposed in the 2017 federal budget? Will those changes affect the type of properties investors will choose to buy? And does tax depreciation change much depending on whether you invest in residential or commercial property? Well, joining me tonight to comment on our stories is Brad Beer from BMT Tax Depreciation. Welcome to the show, Brad. Hi, Chris. Great to be here. Now, this is probably a, a biannual event that we cover depreciation uh, to uh, tell people about all the tax savings. And I guess the, the classic thing is with tax depreciation is most people still don't know what it is and there's money that they're potentially leaving on the table. So uh, maybe start off with the basics. Yeah, look, the basics, Chris. Uh, so much money left on the table all the time, unfortunately. De depreciation is things getting older and wearing out and the tax office allows us in you know investment properties to make a deduction for that wear and tear it's very similar to uh, your car or something you use for business purposes that depreciates in value you get to claim that and the same thing happens when you use a property for for uh, for income producing purposes the the carpet wears out the building wears out uh, and you get to claim the deduction based on that and unfortunately you know two-thirds of people seem to not do this properly and not maximize the deduction properly so we effectively help them to do that. And I guess sometimes they call it the, the magic cash flow in that say you pay 500 grand for a property, you can actually claim additional expenses which reduces your tax, but you're not actually paying for those expenses because you've paid for it in the property. Look, the big thing is it's a non-cash tax deduction. There's a lot of expenses in property that are, have some sort of deductibility uh, if you're in that situation where, you, where you're in a loss. But this one is one that you don't pay out. You get to claim this deduction just because the building's getting older, the building's wearing out, and the tax office says we well, allow to claim deduction for that wear and tear and uh, you don't have to pay it out, so it makes a big difference, it's really good. And uh, I, I guess the trick is, is if you never sell the property, you almost never have to pay the depreciation back, but uh, if you bought a 500 grand property and depreciated it by 50 grand to 450, ultimately when you do sell it for say a million dollars, then uh, your, your cost base is 450 rather than the 500. Yeah, look, there is a, a, a reduction in the cost base uh, where some of that depreciation you do claim, then you do pay some additional capital gains tax in the future if you sell the property. I still, uh, the, the capital gains tax is paid at half your marginal rate and you make these deductions on the way through at your full marginal rate. So we've run the case studies in the past and you actually end up with more money in your pocket today on the way through at today's value that you can use for something than what you're paying capital gains tax in the end most of the time. So it all looks like positive, but no doubt the government will change it and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But probably, uh, I guess the next question is probably what are the most common items that can be depreciated, especially when I guess most of our viewers are probably more into the residential property. Look, the, uh, the, the simple things are the carpets, hot water services, stoves, blinds, curtains, uh, the things that don't last a long time. The tax office says you get to claim them over how long they expect they're expected to last. And the other big, uh, the other big claim is really that structure of the building, providing it's built after 987, you get to claim this deduction against the structure of the building, which is a portion of the construction cost each year. And so what are the assets that uh, investors kind of tend to overlook? Look, I think the, 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 there's, a, there's a lot of assets. The tax office puts out a list of these assets that you get to claim within the property. And, you know, some of the simple things that people don't think, like the garbage bins, the mechanical door closers, and things that are a bit more obscure than the simple you know, carpets, blinds, curtains, but people can see. Um, the important thing is go through and make sure you get all, all of those things claimed. Uh, and also some of that building, if there's been some renovations, you want to make sure that you pick all those things up and all those uh, claims are made. Now, talking about door closers and things like that, I mean, to me, it just it sits straight away. Look, don't try and do it yourself. There's, there's probably no way you can do it. Some people reckon their accountants can do it, but it's a pretty specialised uh, topic, isn't it? Well, there's sort of two parts of that where, firstly, the tax office will accept the estimates uh, done by a quantity surveyor because traditionally what we do as quantity surveyors is estimate construction cost of buildings. So the claims relate to this cost, but on top of that, knowing all of the rules, knowing all the things to claim and making sure, look, we do a full site inspection of the property, we go through it, we find everything that can be claimed and make sure it's all claimed at the maximum we can get for it. Now, there were some new rules for plant and equipment deductions that were proposed in the 2017 uh, recent federal budget. Can you tell us a bit, a bit more about those changes and maybe recent draft legislation that's been released? 
Look, the, the, the government's sort of taken a... a um, I was at the budget night and, and uh, part way through... Thrilling. <laughs> I was thrilling. And then I nearly choked on my steak as, uh, as, they, as they announced some changes to plant equipment and depreciation, which are, were totally unexpected. Uh, and what they've actually done is said that, you know, that, that structure of the building will leave alone and do nothing with. But they're saying now that second-hand properties or second-hand plant and equipment, there will be no deduction for. Uh, and what that means is that sometimes a six-month-old stove, a 12-month-old stove, if you're the second purchaser of that, of that stove, rather than continuing to depreciate, which would be normal, they're saying that when they're not going to allow deductions on that stove. Now, the legislation has just come out in draft and uh, is... Uh, uh, out for consultation with uh, people, so we'll put some papers in on that, as will a lot of other people, I'm sure, uh, to, to to make a suggestion as to uh, a normal way to do this, I suppose. They're calling it an integrity measure where they're, they're concerned that investors are double-dipping and reclaiming things that have been claimed in the past. And there seems to be a bit of concentration on their thinking that people are taking their their fridge from home and sticking their investment property and then claiming it, which I don't see as being a highly regular thing that happens. But um, how to deal with that integrity issue and make sure that it's done properly, I think there's some simple ways that it can be done and that's what we'll, that's what we'll put together. So is that the logic behind this, uh, this change? It's, it's more a double dipping thing rather than uh, trying to cool the market or, or anything like that? Well, they're, they're calling it a, a housing affordability measure I, uh, and I guess um, they're, they're saying there's an integrity issue, which I, I think I don't agree with. The fact is that the legislation currently has a bit of a gap where someone could put it, raise another value on something that someone has claimed in the past. So I think cleaning that up is probably not a bad idea because that's what they're trying to do, they, they're saying, to start with. But then they're taking sort of a bit of a sledgehammer way of doing that uh, in the way they've written the legislation because maybe those that uh, are putting it together don't see that there might be a simpler way to actually get it done properly. Yeah, so, I mean, obviously we weren't necessarily going to debate this, but, I mean, could a brand new property have a depreciation schedule that's, because typically they're set up for, what, 25 or 40 years, and that basically gets owned by that property and, and that's the one that sticks with it forever? Well, that's the, the simple, like a depreciation schedule, yeah, we do it for 40 years. Now, on the structure of the building, that will still be just exactly the same. But really, transacting an asset shouldn't change whether or not the rest of its life is there. You know, things like carpet have a 10-year effective life. If you buy one-year-old carpet, it should have nine years to go because that's its effective life, where they're saying, well, we don't know how to administer that, so we're going to chop off the rest of it for the rest of time. So I think um, it's, a, it's, it's them not knowing a simple way to actually make that happen and therefore trying to take a way to go, well, we'll still leave it there for new properties. And that's one thing that they haven't changed, firstly, is that new properties are exactly the same. And also it's grandfathered. So if you already purchased the property or entered into a contract to buy the property prior to the, uh, prior to the budget night, then there's no effect on you. You keep doing exactly what you're doing. It's just those that have bought since that they're saying that and there should be a simpler way, I think. So do you think that will actually change the type of property that will investors uh, actually kind of choose? Because obviously that would push people away from the second hand into perhaps the new property. Well, it, it's got a potential to do that a little bit. Now, the Division 43 is a fair bit of the claim that you do get over time anyway. So it's not like it went down to a small amount of money that you can claim. There is definitely a bit more benefit now to a new property from a depreciation point of view. I think um, I'm not one, even though I'm the depreciation guy, I'm not one that says you should buy just for tax, just for depreciation. I kind of think that um, you should be buying in the areas that have the drivers for growth and, and other things about that property and tax and depreciation are definitely something that helps your cash flow. Uh, but I think some investors may go, well, especially if you're looking at either a brand new property versus one that's six months old, because that's where the most difference will actually be in the deduction. And I guess this is the knee-jerk reaction and, and maybe something that the media would take straight away, saying, well, you shouldn't buy secondhand, you should only buy new. But say a new property goes up 50 grand and you get an extra 10 grand of depreciation, it's completely different to maybe a secondhand in a better suburb that goes up 100, but you get no depreciation. Again, there's always those investors that will concentrate now, want more tax deductions, and there's the other ones that will say, well, I'd rather the net of 90 than... Uh, 50 minus 10. Look, and you're exactly, uh, it's exactly the point. I'm, I, I don't believe that just buying for tax deductions is where you should start. Um, tax deductions help with cash flow or after tax cash flow to help to pay for that property. So they should be considered and numbers should be crunched, absolutely. But uh, the, the real wealth out of the property is made out of 
uh, out of capital growth and out of the capital value increase of the property. So you've got to choose the ones that have that, but you do have to fund them on the way and depreciation is something that after tax helps you to do that. And I would say the, if the ultimate aim is to give up work early, if you're not paying tax, then you can't claim tax back. So uh, it's almost irrelevant, but uh, obviously for most people then uh, we're not always quite there. Um, probably another thing to jump on is um, maybe off the plan properties. Is, is anything changed around that? You look, off the plan or brand new properties, no changes. So, um, and that's kind of what we're saying there. If you've bought it, if you've made a decision to buy it prior to or after, if it's off the plan, it's brand new. Even if you buy it new and it hasn't been used, um, they, they, in, the, in the draft, they talk a lot about things that have been used in the past. So if the developer rented out for a while, then it'll be secondhand and no, no depreciation on those plant equipment items. Uh, but off the plan, all brand new in whichever way, yeah, um, uh, no change. Now, you mentioned this was proposals. So when does this actually kind of take place or indeed will it actually take place? Could, it, could there be no change in the end? Well, look, uh, what's happened at the moment is it's out for consultation and, and people will put papers in and then it actually has to go back through, get approved, then to the Senate, be voted on. Uh, and the end result of that could be nothing. It could be voted down and nothing, no change. Um, so it is actually effective from anyone who's... Uh, exchange contracts from budget night and applies to anyone from the 1st of July basically for these claims but we're still kind of in limbo a little bit because we don't know whether the legislation will come through not come through but look most people that have bought a property that's that relates to now uh, if you're crunching your numbers you've got a li bit less deduction you've got to consider but if you um, you're not generally doing a tax return yet for something that you've settled in this financial year unless you're adjusting through the year. So there's uh, the, the effect will be on the people that are really doing next year's tax return. So we'd hope to see some legislation well before then. Now, again, mentioning the tax, there's a lot of people that will crunch their numbers down to the nearest dollar. But if whether you get deductions or not is going to make a difference to whether you can afford an investment, you probably shouldn't be buying anyway, because whilst you do get a reasonable amount of deductions, the biggest change in property is that if interest rates rise two or three percent, that could be 20 or 30 grand on a million dollar mortgage that far outweighs any difference in uh, depreciation. Oh, look, absolutely. And it comes back to still the fundamentals of you, you need to have some buffer. You need to look at all, all of the things that come into this property. Can you afford it? Depreciation is only one of those. Um, and the cash flow overall, if you're that close, you've got to be a little bit concerned about whether you should buy it in the first place. Now, many property investors are preparing their tax now, or maybe they should be uh, claiming they are preparing their tax now. So what can they do to try and maximise their depreciation? Well, probably one of the, the, the first things to consider is the fact that um, you can actually back claim for two years if you've been missing out on these deductions. I guess the important thing is before you do another tax return, uh, make sure you get it sorted and get those previous two years before you do another one and potentially miss out on that. With so many people actually missing out, the important thing is really get it done properly, speak to the accountant about what you're claiming. Um, there's calculators that, that are for free that you can use to see how much there should be there and compare it to what you are doing to make sure you're not one of those that does miss out and potentially misses out on another year. Wonderful. Thanks for the update. And uh, we'll catch you after the break, Brad, and we'll go through uh, some of the things for uh, commercial properties as well. But now it's time to jump to Charles Tarby from Century 21. He's got the latest numbers from the auction clearance rates to see how many properties are on the market. Welcome to the show, Charles. How are we doing? Good, Chris. Thank you. I'm glad I'm in a different studio. I'm not sitting next to Brad. I, I, I'd only come up to his shoulders. But uh, you must admit that uh, all of this depreciation talks exciting stuff, isn't it, Charles? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm very excited. Very excited. <laughs> well, you're good with your numbers as well. So uh, let's jump into the auction clearance numbers. There have been a very interesting week this week, Chris. Uh, there was a, a clearance rate nationally of 70.7. Uh, this time last year was 73.9. So for one of the very first times now, we've seen the uh, clearance rate nationally lower than this time last year. And the interesting part was Sydney topped in at 68%. So there you go. Sydney came in below 70. But Melbourne, wow, 77.2%. Melbourne had more properties auctioned than anybody else. So incredibly, uh, still a very strong marketplace. But Sydney, now it's good to watch it touch and go. It's certainly a mixed market at the moment, especially with the media. There's uh, comments kind of firing both ways of buyers down, and uh, but again, some still record results. So I guess the next thing is, is are we getting more properties advertised for sale? No, Chris, that's still a negative. I mean, we are expecting that to change, but it's a negative 0.38% this week over last week. It's been a negative, but only a modest negative for quite some time. 
there is more stock on the marketplace now than we're looking at this time last year. That is a, that is a big difference. But it's just been negative on week on week for some time. Well, I guess people are getting ready. Uh, why wait for spring when you look at the weather that we've had in most capital cities of late? So I think I think spring has already sprung. And again, as, as we say to a lot of the buyers, is sometimes go contrarian. So rather than wait till spring, if there's no mm. properties on the market, could be the best time. Correct. Let's yeah. move on to uh, rent price movements. Uh, only a modest climb this week, 0.47%. Uh, the uh, good one this week was the one that's been going negative for a couple of weeks, and that's been Hobart. It actually had a plus 0.55% increase because it was heading south a little bit there for a while, looking maybe a little bit of a correction. Uh, Melbourne had a, a negative 0.39%. Uh, so there's a positive and negative, two places not too far away from each other. But overall, it's still a pretty steady marketplace when it comes to uh, rent prices. One for we always need the cash flow to pay the mortgage. And finally, the vacancy rates. Well, Melbourne continued to be the leader. It, it has been for quite a number of weeks. It's a vacancy rate of 1.15, which is incredibly slow. It did get down to 0.92% at one stage. But that, you know, 1.15 is, is really, really a, a low vacancy rate. Sydney came in at 1.49%, which isn't too bad at all when you look at that. But Perth, the interesting one that we've been watching for a while, has been hovering back downwards again, which is great, 8.19%. I can see a, a great correction happening in Perth. It certainly is happening with the prices of properties and the sales are starting to be transacted again. It seems to me like Perth has, has hit the bottom in many parts and starting to climb back up. But that average uh, vacancy rate over these, those three capital cities was 3.61%. Wonderful. As always, Charles, you've got an amazing memory for numbers. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you again next week. Thank you very much, Chris. Now, join us after the break as we'll give you some more ideas on saving some tax and getting some more depreciation. Join us after the break. Welcome back to Your Property Empire. Well, joining me on the show tonight is Brad Beer from BMT Tax Depreciation. We're trying to find ways to save you money and pay less tax if you can. Um, Brad, probably a good question is, is renovations. Obviously, people see all these shows. How does that affect uh, depreciation? Well, look, yeah, Chris, uh, renovating, you're changing what's there, you're changing the cost of what's there, so there's more things potentially that are able to depreciate. But even before you do that, uh, the things that you throw away potentially have some value. We, uh, we sort of uh, penned the term scrapping, even though it's not the tax office term. Uh, a, simple, uh, a simple thing is when you throw things away, they potentially have some value left. You get to claim whatever value is left on those things when you throw them away. The important thing is making sure you've actually had the place looked at first so there's a value attached to those things and you depreciate them away until you get to that point where you do throw them away add the new things in, you get to claim the new things, under, the, 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 the depreciate those new things. Another important thing to consider there with the budget changes is that anything that you do buy yourself and add to that property does get to depreciate. So if you buy something uh, old even after budget time, uh, you add new things to it, all these things get uh, added to your depreciation schedule and you can plan for those things, which is kind of nice. Perfect. And um, just before we go, uh, there's quite a few of the viewers that are into commercial property rather than the residential. How does depreciation change between the two investments? Look, there's a few rules that are changed, like the dates of when we can or can't claim that uh, building allowance and, and what percentage that's claimed at. Some of the items get claimed a bit differently. You know, carpet doesn't last as long, so you get to write it off a bit quicker. Um, there's a few different items in non-residential and other types of uh, uh, buildings that, you, um, that, that are slightly different. The fundamentals are quite similar uh, and there's just different rates applied to some of those things. The, I guess the one that people often miss is fit outs. If you actually buy your commercial property and you tenant it or if you fit out your commercial property then those fit outs are sometimes got their plant equipment and things that should be claimed and people think uh, that because of myself maybe I don't get to claim it but you actually do, they're all seen as investment properties. Wonderful. Well, thanks for joining us, Brad. And as I always, quite often with the depreciation, they almost guarantee that uh, whatever you can claim in the first year is more than the, uh, the bill that you're going to get from you. So it's almost a no-brainer. Always make sure they're going to get some money or we don't do it, Chris. Exactly. Great. Well, now it's time to check in with Tom Panos, Head of Real Estate Advertising at News Corp. Welcome to uh, the show, Tom. Hi, Chris. How are you going? Now, I always get these people asking me about uh, which way to bid at auction. And so probably the best question I've got for you today is professional hecklers stirring up the crowd. Do they actually uh, benefit themselves or are they counterproductive? Oh, well, Chris, I had one this week from start to finish. Um, and I get one maybe about once uh, a year. 
uh, maybe maybe once or twice a year, but I had uh, a very strong one. And um, yes, I think that they can sometimes scare another buyer off. Um, the one that I had this week uh, was successful in um, buying the property. Um, he didn't buy it at a bargain, um, but. Um, yeah, it was it was very interesting. I mean, he did not stop. Now, I guess for some, I guess young auctioneers, they could be completely thrown over, and, and the heckler could take over the crowd. I gather you just come back from a auctioneers conference in Noosa. What are the uh, some of the things that the good auctioneers are doing that maybe the other ones aren't? Okay, well, Chris, you know the truth is I've been doing this for uh, a few decades now, and probably the way I handle things on Saturday. Uh, would have been quite different to, uh, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago. And I think best practice now in auctioneering is that an auctioneer is only going to matter in situations where you've got a heckler or you've got a very small interest in the property where you've only got maybe one bidder. The truth is, Chris, anyone in this TV studio could actually do an auction with 10 or 15 people fighting over a property. All you're doing is just repeating what buyers are saying. I think, you know, the real skill is at the pointy end when things are challenging. And I think what they do is they bring calm and peace. Um, they take away the stress out of a situation. They know how to read the play. They keep the momentum going. Um, they build trust with buyers. They actually outline to other parties that the person that is heckling is doing it for self-interest um, to benefit that person. Um, so I think uh, they do all of that. A good auctioneer does all of that but not in an uh, arrogant way, but in a confident way. So would it be true to say the same as you say with sales agents, that any old agent can sell a property for market value, and probably the same goes for auctioneers, but where you get into trouble, or if you really want to sell for that 10 or 20% premium, you need the better agent, you need the better marketing, and you need the better auctioneer, depending on the day. Well said. I think the issue is it's not about finding any buyer, it's about finding the best buyer. And I think it's not about getting the property sold, it's about getting a house price or unit price maximisation. And I mean, there's a process. Um, and part of the process is that you've got to, you know, understand fundamentally that, you know, not all school teachers are the same, not all lawyers are the same, not all football players are the same, not all buyers agents are the same. Chris, you'd agree with that. You believe that, you you know, there's certain value you bring to the table. And I think between a good auctioneer and a good agent, there is potentially 10% that can be left on the table if you don't pick the right auction and uh, auction ear and agent working together as partners in your sale if you're a seller of a property. Great tips as always, Tom. Thanks for joining us and we'll look forward for your tips next week. Thank you. And thanks for joining us at home this evening as well. Until next week, I'm Chris Gray. Good night in this program is general in nature and therefore should not be relied upon. Guests appearing on the program may have commercial arrangements with some of the companies mentioned. Before making any investment, insurance or financial planning decisions, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you.